Um, so my name is Sarah Medina Kamishuli. I'm going to be sharing a bit today about the Peer Defense Project. Um, I am a lecturer in the Education Studies Department, and um, I will be a lecturer also at the Pauli Murray College next uh, semester. Um, and so it's really a gift to be here with you all. Um, I'll be sharing specifically about the Peer Defense Project, but more broadly would be really happy to share about being a young attorney, um, looking to build practices around movement lawyering, use civil rights work, um, and transformative practices to democratize law. So we start off uh, with first five, confidentiality. So this is recorded and will be shared, and I can't, I can't promise anything here will be kept confidential. So I ask that people don't ask any sensitive questions about com any confidential concerns they have, any legal questions, um, and to please reach out to me if you have any specific concerns like that. Um, capacity, we always check in to make sure everyone in our, um, in our group is feeling good, our folks, good in terms of water and food. We're gonna be talking about some heavy topics today. So I just wanna make sure that folks are good to go as we're moving through that space. Accommodations, um, if folks could enable live captioning, that would be great just to create that accommodation. And also just wanted to create space now for anyone here who had any specific accommodations they'd like to request. Okay, if there's no requests, I'll just say the chat is a space to really make those requests. And to butt in real quick, the live transcript should be on now for everyone um, who would like that. Thanks, Ethan. Um, agenda, I'm gonna run through these uh, this deck for about 20 minutes and then create space for about a half hour of questions and then we'll close at 7.30. I will be facilitating um, and I know that your friends at Yup have now created um, a recording. And so that will be um, an opportunity as well. Um, I would love if folks who are in the chat specifically could change their names to their names, their pronouns. Don't worry about organization. My intentions for today, y'all, are to share about a new legal project that we're building in New York and to invite a diverse community of folks to build out our vision. And so I invite you as I share, you know, if you have, you know, you start to feel something like, oh, that excites me or that interests me, or I can relate to that, to really lean in and share those experiences so that we can really think intentionally about how we can share our networks, our resources, and our expertise with one another. Here is um, a statement that we like to read and begin before we talk about the tools that we build. This is really sort of the why and the driving problem. Today in New York, uh, the public schools teach more than 1.2 million youth in the most segregated schools in the nation. The first most segregated schools for Black youth and the second most segregated schools for Latino youth. That means when we say segregated within this metric of the likelihood of interaction in a school building um, uh, in terms of attending school together between students of different races. Secondly, in addition to school segregation, our courts in New York incarcerate youth in some of the most expensive prisons in the nation that cost almost $1 million per young person per year. And so I always like to really look at that, that there's a million young people who have to somehow attend segregated schools because of budgetary constraints. I'm not quite sure what kinds of defenses that the city and the state would like to make for that. But yet there's money in the city and state budget to incarcerate young people for $1 million per year per person in particular prisons in the state. Additionally, like most local jurisdictions, young people under the age of 18 cannot vote, run for office, sit on school boards with a voting position, or litigate without the support of um, an, an adult litigator. Um, and Peer Defense Project builds legal tools to support young people to gain the resources, institutional power, and autonomy to challenge schools, courts, and government. And really where we've grounded a lot of our work has been in the work of the Movement Law Lab um, and other movement lawyers before us, such as Amanda Alexander, Detroit Justice Project, Law for Black Lives. These are models that have really inspired us and we've really brought back to the work that I'm gonna to share today. 
Our vision is a work, uh, a world where young leaders dismantle systemic racism in schools, in courts, and in government with autonomy, institutional power, and material resources. So just ask us to really be in what that means. If anyone here has ever been to any kind of local court, any kind of housing court, ever accompanied someone who's had to go to court for maybe possibly one of the worst days of their life, you know that those, that oftentimes the experiences of folks, especially low-income folks, especially low-income folks of color and young people is not one of autonomy, institutional power and material resources with or without a lawyer sometimes. Um, and so really what we're talking about is how can we provide and democratize legal education for young people? Our values are that we're youth led, we center and support youth to forge the journey ahead while being apolog unapologetic, inclusive, healing and intergenerational. We are in the process right now of um, hiring a new legal supervisor. So if people have any connections or recommendations to really great um, attorneys who've been practicing for more than two years, we are hiring. Um, but our current team right now is Anes Naranjo, O'Brien Rosario, and I on the executive team, Miriam, who is our founding movement lawyering paralegal, and Anna, who actually is an alum from Yup, and I believe one of the founders, if I'm correct, um, co-founding folks, who is a prison abolition fellow. And our legal advisory, you know, having support with Having support with people who um, have experience uh, is really important in this work as well. And so we have three incredible legal advisors on our legal advisory board that support us with additional layers of supervision, guidance, and consulting. That's Isatu Barry, Darren Mumphrey, and Julian Han. Um, and they are three attorneys, two from New York and one from DC, who really support us to being able to do this innovative work while maintaining the professional ethics um, and regulations necessary to have any kind of legal advice issued or practice any kind of law. Our fiscal sponsors Integrate NYC. And for those of you who are looking to build your own organizations, a fiscal sponsor is a really effective way to be able to build a new project out, to be able to receive grant money, um, but to be able to do it in a transitionary stage. And so I'm going to tell a little bit about the story of how we're connected to Integrate NYC, but I just wanted to name this as a really effective tool for people who are thinking through building new projects and looking to find ways to have money circulate through them in a way that um, honors tax code. So a little bit about the history. Um, in 2014 and 2016, this is me many haircuts ago. That is my planted joke. The only problem with this recording is that people will know that that's my planted joke now. And this is us uh, or me in a classroom with many of my students having conversations about how segregation existed, for example, in ESL classrooms where I was a Spanish teaching, Spanish speaking ESL educator who had students who were fluent English speakers in my class for years. Um, and the question they always ask is why am I here um, if I speak English fluently? And I found that interventions that the state had made to provide um, necessary services to many bilingual students and many students who were, um, or I should say multilingual students and students who are learning new languages were sometimes forced upon families um, due to administrative breakdowns um, and other kinds of bias in the matriculation process. Um, and so basically to how to say that in a less jargony way is when young people would show up, they would get tested for ESL if they had Latino last names. And if their parents didn't get properly notified that, that happened, they could be placed in ESL for years and years. And so this really inspired me, especially as a Boricua educator, to think about how um, interventions that don't include youth voice can really cause harm. Um, harm specifically in ways that hold them back from being able to get access to graduation and educational resources. So we started organizing. Um, this is us organizing. You can see Annette in here, um, uh, really one of the original uh, uh, leaders of this work. And so we started coming together and saying, you know, what is segregation? And what is segregation not from the vantage point of predominantly white schools that are going to, quote, save seats for low income black and brown students, but instead, um, what does it look like to actually see this issue from the vantage point of students who have been segregated? 
And so we built the five R's of real integration, which really move beyond concepts like seeing the Little Rock Nine as an example of, ed, of integrated education that was acceptable um, and really thinking about instead of saving a couple seats, removing barriers to the schools that place barriers in front of their enrollment policies that kept uh, predominantly black, brown, and some Asian students out. Um, we thought about resource allocation and teacher representation and culturally responsive curriculum and restorative practices. And uh, de Blasio created a mayoral task force, which is essentially a mayoral appointed um, group of people who say they're gonna work on a policy, but the mayor can do whatever the mayor would like to do with an appointed group like that. And so we had students who really thought they were going through a legitimate process to have a policy implemented. And excuse me, it wasn't. It was largely something that was used as a space to bring together advocates, but not necessarily a space to make systemic change. And of course, in addition to our young people waiting and waiting for these policies to be implemented, then COVID-19 hits and we have an exacerbation of racial injustice um, and harm and segregation in New York. We really started thinking about what does it mean to build other tools that support young people and impacted communities, uh, specifically by racism and inequity, to be able to demand and implement and enforce uh, policies that are more life affirming and institutions that are life affirming. So we talk about building, incubating, and sharing legal tools and practices to support youth leaders to build power and autonomy in schools, courts, and government. Here are the tools that we talk about when we talk about democratizing legal access and education, listening, learning, leading, leveraging, legislating, and litigating. Specifically um, within the youth context, I can kind of go through these. In New York, for example, if a young person would like to file a complaint, often their parents have to sign off on that complaint. We've heard many stories of students, for example, students who come from immigrant families who fear the ways in which the um, uh, immigration enforcement may be connected with the schools, other families who are historically um, surveilled by the um, uh, family law <coughs> system, concern that if they file a complaint, they may be punished by um, having educators or other school leaders bring some sort of um, filed some sort of complaint against the family. And so a real fear of retaliation or sometimes just that a parent doesn't agree that that's a concern um, or a parent doesn't have time um, or interest in filing a complaint. There's barriers to listen to students in terms of violations and how they're happening. In terms of learning, what are student rights and what are the cases being brought on behalf of young people? This is a really big question. Um, when a young person said, I have a right to a First Amendment, or I have a right to um, my own personal property, or I have a right to um, um, read the books that I want to read, it's really actually um, surprising. Young people have, students specifically have, are the group with some of the least rights in this country. Corporal punishment is still legal in this country in public schools on a federal level. State, many state and local levels don't allow corporal punishment, but students can still be physically punished in school. Um, additionally, students have in many places less rights than folks who are incarcerated to access to reading materials um, in terms of the rights that folks have um, to have sort of freedom um, to I should say specifically in carceral libraries um, versus libraries in public schools. Um, and you know, a lot of these conversations are very, um, very challenging to have sort of pit against different groups as having more or less rights because they shift, but really talking about rights is very important because oftentimes people aren't uh, aware of the ways in which youth rights can change based on local jurisdiction and how little protections there are for young people on the federal level. In terms of leading, young people often aren't allowed um, in New York, specifically more than, I think it's the cap is now eight, one 18 year old can sit on a school board, but that person can't vote. Um, and then there's there can't be any more youth representatives. And so what does that mean in terms of leading? 
obviously leveraging power with uh, contractual negotiations. A lot of the time, young people may think they're signing a contract and they're not. Young people may think that there's some kind of requirement um, that there is, um, let me put this on, um, some protection for them, but there's not. Um, legislating and litigating is also really important as well because obviously youth cannot vote and youth cannot run for office under the age of 18 and bringing lawsuits is incredibly complex um, and often requires a group of adult allies and attorneys who can be supportive. Our practices as we build these tools are that we're making sure to build youth legal autonomy, create youth legal resources, build youth institutional power, and create anti-racist legal practices. I want to show a little bit about what this looks like. Specifically in the realm of integration, um, I've shared a little bit about the case. When we built this case, we made sure that we had an intergenerational plaintiff outreach. There was not a group of strange attorneys knocking on doors in the South Bronx asking people if they wanted to be part of a segregation lawsuit. This was a real grassroots effort with attorneys and legal workers and organizers thinking about how to strategically um, reach out in ways that were trauma informed. You can see our training on trauma informed interviewing practices on our YouTube channel. Um, and really making sure that we are connecting with existing organizations doing work. Additionally, we created a pilot program for um, peer observers. So young people who were interested in becoming part of the case could learn how to identify violations in their school community. And then also we created intergenerational plaintiff toolkits. So you can see here, as we move through the case, we create tools so the young people who are in the litigation can understand where we're at and actually have be properly informed to be able to weigh in on the things that young people are supposed to weigh in in regarding their cases. In terms of learning around this, we've built Know Your Case tools. Oftentimes there might be a, hey, young person, join our case and you're a plaintiff. And then, hey, join this phone call if you want to learn about it. And then, oh, hey, we're in settlement now. Uh, would you like to come to the meeting? But here we've built multilingual technology um, <clears throat> and intergenerational press conferences where young people can really understand the, the legitimacy of the case, the power of the case and where it's at. Um, we've also built public forums to show the way that the case impacts other movements. Um, a lot of the times when litigation happens, sometimes this sort of intersectional analysis isn't done. And so we recently had a um, public forum event where we brought in um, the attorney for Breonna Taylor and um, Trayvon Martin's family, as well as attorneys from LDF fighting attacks on CRT, as well as attorneys protecting data privacy for young people and um, advocates working in public health to talk about the importance of our lawsuit demanding racial justice and education. Um, and then we've been working also, and this is how we've been connected with YUP, specifically within the realm of supporting the movement around abolition. Now, remembering that as a peer defense project, we do not create the integration movement, we do not create the abolition movement, we do not create the youth governance movement. We supply supportive tools that allow people to understand their rights, where there may be some legal issues, and then we, with that education and with that collective understanding, then support young people to continue moving forward as might be helpful, useful to the work that they would like to do in community. So specifically on abolition, we worked with um, the New York City um, uh, engagement uh, commission that worked with a bunch of folks on this call that worked to take a retired prison bus from Rikers Island and convert it into a community um, resource center on wheels. Um, and so I want to name just like how important that is in terms of abolition often being a scary word for people. Um, and so for us, this is a really important first step in being able to say, this is how we understand abolition, taking a carceral state and transforming it into a life affirming institution that meets intersectional needs in a dramatically reimagined way. Um, and so this is uh, one of the tools that we've worked on in terms of listening. On that bus, we built this survey. Shout out to Sid and Ethan and Fakir who worked on this with us um, to really ask young people, how do you understand abolition? What is that to you? So that when we're making tools, we're responding to that. And so what we really started to find was that young people related more to words like punishment and abolishing youth punishment systems 
rather than the idea of just abolishing partial systems. And so we built this political education guide, which actually is launching on the 16th. Um, I'm, I know Ethan and um, Flick here that y'all sent this out, um, but I would love if you could bump it again, the event. Um, so we're doing an event on abolishing youth punishment and carceral systems in New York, and really under having the people understand fully um, what are the systems that have been identified Some people don't fully understand that when young people are given a zero as a grade, it can create a gap that's impossible to close, especially when that gap is based out of a 4.0 scale when competing for college. And so thinking about the ways in which punishment of you have a zero is a form of punishment that impacts college access rates um, all the way into thinking about restraint um, and police brutality in schools, incarceration in both juvenile facilities and in adult facilities, and also things such as family separation and immigration detention. Um, and we define young people as nine to 25. So it's a big range here. Um, and uh, for us, this really is about creating the understanding from the kinds of survey results that we've received thus far. But after we have this guide, we're also going to be partnering with other folks and yep, hopefully to continue to refine this um, survey so it can be something that really reflects this understanding as well, constantly an emergent iterative process. In terms of leading, we've built a peer defense uh, fellowship. Actually, our fellows are going to be presenting um, tools that they've created, specifically an art exhibition um, on the 16th at our event to show how they have taken all of this information and made it embodied and understood. And so that art exhibit will be at the, um, at the forum. We also have worked with a really amazing a really amazing collective multiracial or uh, collective called uh, the People's Platform, um, the People's Plan, which is a large platform um, that has addressed intersectional issues. And we worked with some amazing um, students uh, also connected to Yale, um, Josie specifically, who I believe also has been involved in YUP as well, um, on working to draft model policy for a youth review board in juvenile detention facilities and psychiatric facilities. And then we have been working on youth governance. Um, in New York specifically, we have mayoral control, meaning there is not community control at the local school board level. And so we've been learning with young people, like, what is mayoral control and how does it impact young people? So we've created know your system tools so that young people can fully understand where the points for organizing exist. For example, if mayoral control exists and that's why the school boards don't have power and on the school boards you can't vote, it seems like there's sort of two pieces there, right? There's the abolition of the mayoral control, the transformation of how school governance works and also creating the right to vote for young people. And so those are sort of some of the tools that have we've been building as well. And as we've been having these conversations, um, this all seems like such beautiful and intersectional work and I'm so proud of it, but we get calls all the time asking for really basic survival needs. Hey, I'm facing an issue in terms of housing. Hey, I'm facing an issue in terms of immigration. Hey, and we are not practicing those areas of law. And so what we've been working on is building a um, mutual aid legal services network where we can have a rapid response legal services network for free services for young people and we're curating that and also we're building out for young people who in addition to having those rapid needs have longer term needs regarding employment and are really interested in our work but just don't know how to tap in or get access to legal education we're building an open source paralegal certification program online where people can work through the course asynchronously, um, build a portfolio asynchronously, um, and then even use it as a way to apply to work with us as well. Um, this is our current ask. Um, we are going to be having an open up the cages event. Um, it's in the chat. Um, and really, I just wanted to be um, supportive for y'all here. Um, I want to feel that you all can you know, ask questions. And I know you prepared a bunch of questions that I'm happy to go through if people don't have immediate questions right 